Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Remington Number no. 3 Semi Hammerless Single Shot Break Action Shotgun, also known as the Model 1893, and I assure you, this is a combat firearm. I'll explain why after we throw it in the light box. My example here clocks in at 47.6 inches in length and weighs 5.9 pounds. This is, however, sporting a 32 inch barrel your options may vary. The magazine capacity is zero. There is no magazine as it is a single shot break action shotgun and in this case taking the 12 gauge cartridge. One final consideration is that this gun is single action only. You must manually cock the hammer. Today's episode is something of an odd one, as if you can't tell. I have no idea whether or not it will be popular to the swirling social media masses, but I don't have to worry too much about that because I am first and foremost responsible to our investors. Those of you who have chosen to donate just a fraction of your cash every single month to make sure that these history lessons get created. You fund this show overwhelmingly, which means we get to bring both the obvious and the obscure in equal measure. Additional funding for this episode has also been provided by, you'll never guess this one, Ballastol, a product that we've long been using anyway. But now that they help keep the lights on, I've made it a habit to note unusual instances when their products came in handy, like filming this episode. And this is no lie. You can't make this up. We're out here in the cold and we need to use the hand thrower for something. And this thing I've thrown a thousand times with no problems and all of a sudden I can't throw it for crap. And we realize it's cold and it's binding up and it's just not as flexible as it was. And we're half putting the clay in, half putting the clay out. No, ballastol. I mean, it's, again, I know it's a commercial guys, but Literally, I'm using Ballastol to save my ass out here once again. By the way, I cut my hand. Uh, FDA says I can't tell you what I did about that. But now all of a sudden, I'm able to use my actual clay thrower again. When I couldn't get it to come out at all a second ago. Yeah, that's working. All right, on to the episode. It should be fairly obvious that this is not a firearm that was designed for military service, let alone conflict. Yep, this is a sporting shotgun, specifically one produced by Remington. Founded by a rifle at Remington, E. Remington & Sons was a major player in the American arms industry, earning a particular fame with their simple and reliable military rifle, the Remington Rolling Block. These 1860s carbines and rifles would be a long-lasting financial success and becoming perhaps the most common gateway breech loader for armies around the world. The rolling block had been, from Remington's perspective, the creation of Joseph Ryder, a man who is often credited with our shotgun today, and yet I've not been able to solidly tie a relevant patent to his name. More on that in a moment. Ryder's rolling block rifles would also be adapted into smallish board shotguns. Notably, the Remington No. 1 and Sportier No. 2. These were 20-gauge single shots of utilitarian construction. A nicer double-barreled shotgun was released by Remington in 1874, one of the earlier options in the U.S. market. From here, a number of advancing designs of Remington double barrels would eventually emerge, and in 1888, the company itself would be sold over to both Marcellus Hartley and Winchester Arms. Hartley would later take full control of the Remington Concern, which he had renamed the Remington Arms Company. Our shotgun today comes square from the company's Hartley years. The year after the ownership change, Remington released the Model 1889 double barrel shotgun. This would last in production until about 1910. A competently produced sporting arm, the Model 1889 suffered from market pressure as the US especially was very price conscious. Competition from Crescent, Forehand, and Hopkins and Allen would have been enough trouble, but the Belgian producers were overtaking the world when it came to inexpensive double barrels, regardless of shipping and duties. Remington literally could not produce cheaply enough to beat the competition to the bottom, so they opted to punch up. Their model 1894 double would be targeted at scraping off the bottom of the higher end market, which wasn't the most profitable strategy either. Now, this would have been awful if they hadn't hedged their bets. However, around the same time as the 1894 was in development, Remington was taking a hard look at their aged single shots. They were still stuck on that rolling block all the way back from the 1860s. That needed changing. Now, like I said a moment ago, Joseph Ryder is frequently cited as the inventor of Remington's new single shot uh, break open action. And I can find patent drawings for a few double guns that he developed around the same time. Unfortunately, 
These don't display any of the unique features found in the single barrel that I have here today. Instead, my gun is clearly an evolution of the James Purdy 1863 English patent uh, that involved a locking bolt break action. Also featuring William Scott's English patented overlever of 1865. These two core features were a market staple by this point. As we'll see later though, there are some unique components in the 1893 Remington shotgun. Unfortunately, I've been unable to turn up any matching patents that would have been in the hands of the Remington company though. That doesn't mean they aren't out there, just that, well, commercial single shot shotguns aren't something that we're very practice on. Also, there's no patent dates on the gun itself, which is a little suspicious. <sighs> With the exact lead up missing, all I can say for sure is that this gun first appeared in Remington's 1893 catalog. Priced at just $10 and initially offered in only 12 gauge, in 1894, 16 and 20 gauge options would be added. These were expanded in 1898 to include 10, 24 and 28 gauge, but you had to pay a dollar extra for those. The first deliveries of the 12 gauge were expected in September of 1893. But what was Remington offering? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. All right, we have mostly barrel, more barrel. There we go, we've got our fore end. We have our receiver. We have, well, two levers. We'll talk about those in a moment. Semi pistol grip stock, ooh, nice high comb. Come on back and a hard rubber, maybe gutta percha buttstock. Let's bring her on back and look at really the core of the action though, because I think you guys understand round barrel. I think you understand the rest. This is what we want to look at. At a glance, I hope you guys can see that this is a fairly simple, inexpensive single shot shotgun for its era. Now we have just the one barrel, no magazine, and it is a break action. We also are what Remington is calling semi hammerless. That means there is an internal hammer, but it's not visible on the outside of the gun. And yet something is. So let's look at it this way. Lever number one releases the action. It opens her up and boom, we can go on into the gun. From here, we can go ahead and load a cartridge. Although in this case, I have a, a dummy. So we'll put that in, close her up, and then we must, you know, can't just pull the trigger. We must cock the hammer. So we pull on this guy, which acts like a tumbler and boom, you might've seen the trigger twitch. Our hammer inside is now set up on that trigger, and then we want to fire the gun, we can just go ahead and boom. Now, the camera isn't running at the fastest frame rate, so you might have missed that, but watch this guy carefully. There's a bit of wiggle at the end. See how it can over travel and then comes back down? That's because this is an auto rebounding hammer. We'll see it better in the animation, but essentially, the trigger and one other component are putting pressure back on the hammer to keep it from constantly keeping the firing pin indexed into the cartridge. That's good because when we break it open or slam it shut, we don't necessarily want pressure resting on the firing pin and therefore causing a discharge. The side lever actually releases a locking block that we can't see well just yet that is engaged on two points of the barrel. We can get a better look at it by going ahead and taking this gun down, which is accomplished very simply by pushing this button right here. And then we can just open up our action, tip our barrel down, and then rock her on back. Once we're clear, we'll see, well, you know what, let me zoom in a little bit. At the rear of the barrel, we just have a couple of simple uh, components. Right here and right here are two, well, notches set into lugs. Those correspond with a locking block that we'll see in a moment that therefore locks in two positions on the barrel, giving nice firm support and keeping it from being able to open up when fired. The other component that we can see here is, well, this little pin here. And if I press on that, you'll see that our extractor comes out the other end. This happens uh, very slowly, as a matter of fact, when we open the gun up. That's because of this little guy here. Again, a little bit easier to see in the animation, but opening the gun up causes this little foot to kick over onto this guy, which then pushes out our extractor. It does so smoothly and evenly, which means it is not an ejector. The cartridge is presented slowly, so it would be a bit like that. And that's all you'd get. No popping out, no flying away. You have to manually pull it the rest of the way out. This is a simple gun. Looking down into the receiver from above, we can actually see our locking block. That would be 
this shiny guy right here, which has an oval cutaway, and then this is a, the same block at the rear. We'll see this more clearly in the animation, of course, but let me just go ahead and work this lever, and you can see I'm able to retract the block, and then it automatically springs forward. Retract, spring forward. This is the lock position, this is the unlock position, allowing the breech to tip. Right here, it's a little hard to make out, is our firing pin. And if I go ahead and over travel that hammer, she'll poke on out. But if I let off of her, she'll bounce back. That's because a combination of two springs are resetting the hammer back to a rebounded position. One is the trigger, which uh, as it is pushed back, uh, biases against the detent position on the hammer. We'll see that in the animation a lot better. And two, there's actually a coil spring wrapped around the firing pin, which is pressing it rearward as well. The two combined put just enough pressure onto the hammer to want to slack back into this retracted position. That means that when we fire the gun, the hammer over travels forward with inertia to bap and then retracts. This uh, is excellent because that means there's no chance of slamming this shut and therefore detonating around. Now, being a simple commercial arm, that's really about it for this gun. It's designed to be, well, simple, inexpensive, and very easy to use. This is not a robust military weapon that we're accustomed to in this show, and so this segment's a little bit brief. I will say, while I have this example here in front of us, I should point out that it's not in the best condition, nor really are any of them that I've seen in the market. It actually took me several years to find this one in shootable condition. But, as produced at the factory, we would actually expect uh, the finish to look a fair bit different. Uh, the receiver is supposed to be case hardened with the barrel blued. They've both settled into a lovely dull gray. <laughs> Now, of course, I can only go so deep without uh, busting out the screwdriver, and even then, it's quite the handful to get all the parts arranged and explained in any meaningful way. Luckily, we have Bruno, our animator, to help us out with this a little bit better. All right, folks, this is a new one for the show, a break-open shotgun. So let's start by looking at that top latch. Rotating it will tip a wrap around the rocker, which serves as a transfer bar to the actual bolt. So if we pivot the lever, the rocker tips, and the bolt is retracted, allowing the user to tip open the action. This combination spring is responsible for placing pressure on both the trigger and the rocker. If we release the lever, the spring tips the rocker, returning the top lever and driving the bolt forward. Although, with the barrel open, the bolt can't return to lock. Now we can manually load our singular cartridge, allowing it to rest on the extractor before closing the barrel back up. As we do, Note the locking block springs into place, sealing us back shut. This external lever is, essentially, the hammer spur. The number 3 does not have an automatic cocking mechanism. You must manually depress the lever each time in order to cock the hammer. When cocked, the hammer is held back directly by the trigger. Simply pull to release. The trigger also has a secondary function. Along with back pressure from the firing pin spring, the trigger also serves to bias the hammer into a rebounded position. This is accomplished by sear surface pressure on this V-shaped groove in the hammer face. Before we open her up, this is the extractor, which includes a long pin that runs up against this odd crescent-shaped piece. When the action is opened and the barrel tips downward, the crescent impacts the lower frame, causing it to pivot into the extractor pin, pushing out the extractor and the cartridge with it. This is not, however, an ejector, so the cartridge must be removed manually. Let's go ahead and shoot this thing, as it was usually put to work in the commercial sporting world.
If this was an episode about a simple single shot sporting gun, we'd be 90% finished. However, in the course of other research, I bumbled into an interesting story about this shotgun, one that I haven't managed to find written out by anyone else, at least in any detail. Instead, I find stray mentions of this gun in the margins of books that technically have a different focus. So most of the rest of this episode is going to be made out of an amalgam of these loose threads and some original research of my own that I've managed to loosely quilt together into a story. It will also take place almost exclusively in the Philippines. That is, of course, after American occupation. All right, buckle up for an Othias rundown. These are members of the Filipino staffed but mostly European officer Guardia Civil a Spanish security force meant to help oversee their Philippine territory. The Guardia Civil was considered a very severe martial police force known for being heavy-handed and determined to get a confession. These forces would also be fielded during the Filipino Revolution of 1896, which is frankly a complicated conflict. In a nutshell, anti-Spanish, anti-colonial forces under the leadership of Andre Bonifacio started a revolutionary government, a general revolt against the Spanish, and attempted an attack on Manila. The Guardia Civil, however, interrupted that last point especially, and the revolution kind of spiraled. Ultimately, uh, Bonifacio would be replaced and even later captured and executed by Emilio Aguinaldo, who would in turn lead the revolutionary forces, although this ended in a truce during 1897, the war would go hot again in 1898, thanks to the American forces joining as part of the much larger Spanish-American War of that same year. While the U.S. did bring back Aguinaldo and further fan the flames of revolution when the dust was settled, well, y'all know what the difference is between a Yankee and a dang Yankee? The danged one doesn't ever go home. And so began the Philippine-American War, which boiled over around February of 1899. By September, however, the U.S. was able to recruit their own Filipino troops. These would initially be the Philippine Scouts, an army organization using Philippine soldiers and U.S. officers. By November, Aguinaldo and his men were fairly uh, deflated and switched to guerrilla warfare tactics. In March of 1901, he would be captured by General Funston. From there, he swore an oath to accept the authority of the United States over the Philippines and issued a formal surrender. He called on his troops to lay down their arms, but this wasn't entirely successful. Also in March, the U.S. Congress passed an act permitting the U.S. President the authority to establish a civil government in the Philippines, which would be formed in July, headed by William H. Taft as the reluctant civil governor. From here, things changed pretty rapidly in the Philippines, but for our show today, we just care about one organization, the Philippine Constabulary, which was established for the purpose of better maintaining peace, law, and order in the various provinces of the Philippine Islands. Then Lieutenant Colonel Henry T. Allen was designated Chief of the Constabulary, breveted to Brigadier General. His initial policy was similar to the Scouts. However, Filipinos could be officers, and two were appointed during the very first month of operations. In the early days, the Constabulary was an awful mess. The Philippine Islands are large, spread out, and full of various peoples and practices. Many regions are more remote than they might appear. Opposition might be organized or even erratic, and there were a lot of ways a guerrilla might flee back into hiding. Honestly, some of the best possible men for the constabulary would come from the old Guardia Civil, but that was a fairly ruthless organization by comparison, making for some overzealous actors and disciplinary problems. On the other end of the problem spectrum, plenty of revolutionaries would try to join up just so that they could steal arms and ammunition and other equipment for their cause. The best the constabulary could do at first was to ask for two reliable character witnesses for every man that might want to join. This limited recruitment at a time when manpower was desperately needed. All this is to say that it's fairly obvious that the army was more than skeptical of this new civilian, natively staffed constabulary. So, when Allen put in a request for over 1,000 rifles for his troops to use, Major General Adna Chaffee, then commanding the General Division of the Philippines, said no. You guys are going to have to get by with the oldest stuff we are willing to spare because we don't want these guns turned on us. This created a severe problem of competing goals. All right, the U.S. Army doesn't want to give uh, Filipinos the then-current military rifle. 
that would be, at the time, a small bore flat shooting smokeless powder repeater. So lots of shots from a rifleman that isn't easily given away by his muzzle blast. No, the army wasn't going to have that. They wanted the constabulary limited to black powder and short ranges. This, of course, conflicts heavily with the fact that these civil servants were expected to take on bandits and guerrillas who may have surplus rolling blocks or even Spanish Mausers. Now, in defense of that army position, most attacks on the constabulary wouldn't involve firearms. It was far more common that anti-colonial rebels hid themselves in the local population or directly in the brush along narrow trails. Uh, they could then leap into action with an inexpensive and more available blade, usually a Chris of some sort. The rarer but most infamous type of determined Filipino attacker was the Juramentado, a Moro man who had sworn to fight to the death, uh, shaved his head, usually dressed in white, prayers, ritual, you get the idea. They regularly bound their bodies tightly, uh, preventing any wound that wasn't immediately fatal from actually bleeding out quickly. Think of it like being pre-tourniqueted. The U.S. Army had already discovered this could be a very effective strategy against their 30 caliber rifles and 38 caliber pistols. As we've seen elsewhere in our series, this would invite a return to the 45 caliber pistol cartridge. As a matter of fact, the Army and Constabulary would refield the Colt 1873 single action revolver, both for its stopping power and frankly the inexpensive surplus ammunition on hand. As we've covered before, the Constabulary would also opt for the Colt 1878 in the same cartridge with some strange modifications in order to use that same surplus ammo. The Army would also reintroduce the 45 cartridge in their triple action Colt 1909 revolvers, bought as a stopgap while awaiting the new service automatic. Okay, that takes care of handguns, but what about long guns? <sighs> what can instantly stop a charging Moro, uses black powder, and won't be effective outside of 100 yards? Perfect, Winchester's fairly new repeating shotgun available in both full length and riot configurations. This is ideal. And I have read that there was an early order for 1,000 Winchester repeating shotguns from the Philippine government. I've been unable to confirm this contract, and it appears that it wasn't entirely satisfactory anyway. Likely the guns were not available quickly enough in such large numbers for overseas delivery, and even if they were, 1,000 would not be enough as we'll soon see. They also were fairly expensive at that time. The constabulary would have to reach for something available and affordable. The good old number three shotgun, which apparently was already on hand in limited quantities. Now, I have not been able to fully flesh out the service life of the Remington number three in uh, the US Army, but I have managed to turn up a few clues. Most notably, a 1904 ordnance supply manual assembled by George Lower. In this massive tome, some attention is given to our Remington, which was issued both west of the Mississippi and overseas as a foraging shotgun, a means by which men in the field could top up their food supply with fresh available meat. These were issued as a pair to each company or troop entitled to their use with an allowance of 500 paper cartridges between them. These were divided unevenly into number four, number six, and number eight configurations. The report also lists the cost at which shotgun cartridges could be sold to men for their private use. That list includes both paper and brass shells, smokeless and black powder, which implies there were more options available than just the three types of smokeless paper cartridge. Moreover, there is brief mention that all ammunition shipped overseas was issued only in metallic shells. And this is where we're missing a key part of our story. According to Bruce Canfield's Combat Shotguns book, Hartley and Graham of New York show massive orders of Remington No. 3s for the U.S. Army in the Philippines starting in 1900. These would tally to some 5,450 in total. Some of the invoices also note that the guns were requested to be cut down to a 28-inch barrel with a new bead sight fitted. Hartley and Graham also later provided shotgun cartridge belts made specifically for the Philippine Constabulary, which might make you think that these guns were ordered for them specifically, but recall the Philippine Constabulary was formed in August of 1901, after the first 4,000 were already ordered. That means that there was some significant martial use before the establishment of the civil government. Now this is speculation, but they were likely intended to be mixed with regular arms as a stopgap solution to the aforementioned determined attacker problem. 
It also seems a fair few were issued out to officers, at least that's what's suggested by a little line in another 1904 report that I found. It lists various army sales of arms, ammunition, and supplies to the Philippine civil government and makes specific mention of two sources for the Remington shotguns, those repaired by the army and sold to the civil government at a discount of 20% of invoice price, and those not repaired but turned over by officers who had them in use sold at a discount of 40%. Only 100 shotguns were repaired at the 20% discount, however 1,604 were turned over from those in use. Moreover, this same document lists 25,439 brass shelled buckshot cartridges, which means that they were on hand. We'll talk more about numbers in a bit, but as things stand, we now know both the Army and later Philippine Constabulary were using this firearm. The latter in particular was given black powder buckshot cartridges specifically so they could not hide their position in a firefight. Victor Hurley's book Jungle Patrol quotes an officer of the regulars as saying, by no means arm the constabulary with smokeless repeating rifles. Do not arm them with rifles at all. If they are held to black powder shotguns, they will be infinitely less dangerous should they revolt. The smoke of the black powder shells will reveal their positions to army sharpshooters. The Remington's in service, by the way, were likely in that 28 inch barrel length. Although mine here is an original 32 incher, I guess it will have to do for May's uh, second demonstration of this episode, the one with black powder buckshot. Kabloom! And then you disappear in a cloud of smoke. From what little data we have, it appears that these shotguns were at their most important in the very early years of the constabulary. Again, this was a time in which the government needed as many constables as they could get, but had very low trust in the recruits. Training was also hurried and haphazard. An academy wouldn't be established until February of 1905. By that date, the Philippine constabulary was also really receiving rifles. Our 1904 report lists 7,370 Springfield carbines in police or constabulary service. These were also black powder and single shot, but at least they had some range. 3,989 rolling blocks taken from the Spanish or Rebels were also on hand. The Remington number no. 3, though, still clocked in at second place with 6,448 in total, although only 643 were listed in the field with the constabulary. 3,429 were in inventory in Manila, the remaining 2,000 376 were in service with the municipal police, which you might note have only these rolling blocks and Colt revolvers. As a matter of fact, it seems the shotgun remained important to the municipal police force beyond the years it served in the constabulary. A separate report, again from 1904, lots of writing in 1904, makes specific mention of the Springfield trapdoor carbines. These were reported in the constabulary as greatly improving morale, being found superior to the rolling blocks, and especially the shotguns. The same report, however, had an interesting backhanded compliment for the municipal police. The municipal police are not so entirely worthless as they are generally reputed to be, and many instances can be cited where they have rendered most efficient service alone or in cooperation with the constabulary. Armed with a most improper weapon, the Remington shotgun, they have in several instances taken desperate chances against bodies of bolo men that would serve to cause a force of constabulary to move with more care. 
With the later firming up of the constabulary and the municipal police into a reliable and trustworthy force, the limited range and slow loading of the Remington shotguns were no longer both a curse and a blessing. Without the latter, they would be replaced by trapdoor carbines and eventually modified crags. Although that's another story for another day, with a fair bit of mystery involved. How the Remington shotguns were released from service remains a mystery to me. I'm unsure if they were sold surplus or, as was common in the Philippines, simply destroyed by being thrown into the bay. I have never seen nor heard of any of these marked in any way that would indicate ownership by the Philippine government. All right. With the government use cleared up, well, as much as possible, let's talk uh, overall commercial numbers. The number three would be produced until 1902, being replaced in 1903 by the improved number nine shotgun. This sported a proper ejector and a removable hinge pin for takedown. Some few of these would also enter US Army use as a foraging shotgun, although not in the Philippines. Total production for the number three is a bit difficult to prove out. Working from incomplete records and known examples, Larry Goodstall estimated 87,850 in total. This is made more difficult because the number three and number nine share the same sequential uh, serial numbers, with intertwining serials in the 90,000 range. While the number three did fairly well in the market, it was mostly hindered by its price. $10 for the standard 12 gauge at a time when a similar gun from Crescent Firearms sold for $6.25. It appears the Remington reputation, however, had kept it afloat. All right, that's the story as I know it so far. Patchy, but stable for sure. And I am pretty happy to shine a light on a rather unusual martial firearm, chosen specifically for being just bad enough and yet still effective. Although we should probably let May be the judge of just how much confidence this thing inspires. So let's go get her opinion. I wanna play Duck Hunt. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. You've told me about Duck Hunt before. They don't let you shoot the dog, right? What do you mean, I told you about Duck Hunt? Yeah. You haven't played Duck Hunt? No, I've never played Duck Hunt. Everybody's played Duck Hunt. I was a little, that was a little pre-me before I was on to the video game. The Nintendo 64 was my first game console set. And then eventually I have my own Atari. It's sitting in the den, but we don't have a TV. <laughs> we have an Atari, but we don't have a TV. I just realized that. I mean, we used to have one that it would plug into, but we gave that to our buddies. So. Dude, I had a dope ColecoVision, and I do not know where it went. Yeah. It got lost the ages of time. I'm sure. Um, that and a Commodore. All right, so we have... A Remington number three. Single shot. Also known as the Model 1893. Actually, if you look for these online, a lot of people don't know what to call them. Really? Um, what do they call them? Well, they call it the 1893, but then they'll call the replacement number nine the 1893 when it's not. It's more like a 1903, but they never call it that. That's weird. There's a lot of confusion around this gun. Oh, yeah, I can um, tell. You check listings online for them for sale or something, right? Mm -hmm. And again, the, the, the number nine will be marked 1893, the number three will be marked who knows what, like it, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. So technically this is a Remington number three, mm -hmm. a single shot break action shotgun. Thank you. Let me give that over to you. Yes, now I have it. Now as someone who has shot both shotguns and military service rifles of this period. True. How are we feeling ergonomically when we're handed that gun? Well, this is my first time, I think, having a lever doodad that we've shot for the show. Yeah, lever opening. Yeah, lever opener. So it's it's different. Okay, kind of cool. Yes, yeah, that obvious single shot. There's no magazine. There's no magazine. <laughs> There's no magazine. Okay, so I've got one shot to make it count. All right, cool. Makes hey, we've sense. been there before on this show. And Mauser 71. And then I load it up. Nothing happens. Why is that? Oh, that's right. I have to actually manually cock the hammer on this one. So it's a, a single action? Yeah. Shotgun. Right. What? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's spoiled, but sure. it's it's different. I'm oh, not used to that. Oh, look at me. I'm I'm a modern person who has to have my gun do all the work. You for said me. compare it to all the previous ones. That's fine. Keep the going. The previous ones were not single action. The previous ones were not single shot only. They had mags and the hammers just operated whenever. Wait, we're talking I about shotguns, or are we talking about rifles now? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were talking about shotguns. Okay, keep going. I'm just making sure we're clarifying because we haven't really filmed. Well, we filmed shotguns. We filmed for the show, or what? Like the Winchester 97 pump action. Yep. Remington Model 10. Yep. I That's it. It. No, yeah, we haven't filmed a lot of shotguns. No. We've handled a lot of people haven't seen the footage, but we have handled a Burgess folding gun. We have, yes. Although and I don't think they've seen that footage of me shooting. I think they've only seen you shooting it. 
I don't know, but we've had footage of it on the channel that has kind of gone under the radar, which is now being shown on this episode, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then you've shot a fair number of shotguns off and on in testing. Yeah. Um, so you actually, weirdly, more so than what's on the show, you have a lot of experience with shotguns. Kind of, yeah, now. But not a lot of break actions, weirdly, because we got on this repeater kick. You've only handled a, a couple of, what, over-unders that people have handled you or side-by-sides you've been handed. Yeah. So... Uh, probably your most comparable gun would be, I believe it's like the Stevens 94, which is what is on, we did that video on the, um, oh good lord, the, 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 uh, Alofs. I don't know why I couldn't remember Alofs. Alofs, wow, it, it's like a popular video that's too. That's good, we'll be playing it while I'm making noises and okay. gesturing. Um, the Alofs uses a Stevens 94 action mm -hmm. as the base, or at least the one we have does. Sure. So, in that regard, you've handled that sort of break open. Yep, but I, we didn't shoot the Alofs, but I did, I did manipulate it, so mm -hmm. there is that. And then Suze has a 20, no, she has a 20 gauge uh, Stevens 94. You've handled that. I can't remember. It's her single shot break open. We've used it That sounds our... vaguely familiar, yeah, I just can't remember. <laughs> okay, so not a lot of experience with single shot break open. No. Okay, how does it feel? Well, the lever on this one feels a little bit flimsy, so that's a concern that I had from the initial get-go. Because I thought, oh no, does that mean it's not sealing up properly, or it will accidentally shoot itself open? No, that is not the fault of the gun, actually, not as designed. Really? So, if you look at our animation, there's that combination spring for the lever, uh -huh. and the paddle part of it that flexes on the lever, mm -hmm. well, indirectly on the lever. Sure. That paddle portion actually snapped off on this gun long ago. Oh. And some uh, shed-based genius <laughs> uh, got a hold of a some... A man with a shed can do a lot. <laughs> he got a hold of some spring stock, but it's a very complicated shaped piece, right? Mm -hmm. So this genius, which I frankly admire, managed to fit and grind down a uh, screw and nut mm -hmm. and drill a hole through the replacement spring extension mm -hmm. and the base of the combo spring. Sure. And he's bolted together a spring extension in there. And it's frankly awesome wow. because it works, but unfortunately the thickness of his replacement spring is a little thin, and so it's just a little light. It's okay. kind of, it, it needs to be basically doubled up. But I can't say that it didn't do its job though. It's, no, it's holding the action shut, that's so, all. That was the only concern I kind of had in terms of uh, flimsiness in, a, in appearance or right. feel on this guy. Otherwise, cocking the hammer, it's actually a pretty strong spring in there, and you can over-travel it just a little bit, but it does spring back into place. Definitely, obviously, cock when it's pushed down. Okay, cool. Right. And I believe I can actually let this down without it being too big of a concern. Yeah, you can yeah. open the action and decock the hammer, which yeah. is a very safe way to be able to handle this gun. Pretty convenient, actually. I like that. Yeah. So if I'm just like, oh, no, I don't really want to fire it right now. Okay, I can lower it on my own. Cool. The how trigger. Do you, how do you feel about the positivity of that hammer, by the way? Oh, just in terms of just the the actual you, size of it no, no, and no, the feel you, of it? Are you getting, like, feedback when you, when you cock it? Because I, I had lands? a little bit of a... You can hear a click, but that's when I know. I can't feel it, though. It's very quiet to me. Yeah, it is actually pretty quiet. I, it's huh? not as pronounced as I would like it to be. So uh, my mic can pick that up, but it is a very quiet one. You're not yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, I, it doesn't... I wonder if it was better new, but to me personally, I find it a little not clicky enough. I would like to hear a more pronounced, like... In there. Yeah, it's like a po that or a positive feel against my thumb or something like that whenever I'm pressing down. Especially because I don't, there's no half cock on this. No. So if you get almost to that position and then slip your thumb off, you're, it's going to go boom. Oh, it could. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. Okay. That's a so... good point. I never thought about that. I'm glad I'm just positively <laughs> pressed. I'm rather down this like, ah, and I push all the way down and I pull. I did notice, like, I did think, I guess maybe subconsciously I might have thought about it because. I did kind of ride the hammer a little bit after I knew. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I had to just test my own theory. So I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Yeah. Let me get that down. So I'm right there. And oh, yeah, definitely. I that could, I could discharge this firearm just by just by slapping that. I did notice, though. Which means you can fan the hammer on this. This is a fanable oh, shotgun. wow. Although it's cool. a little awkward because you, <laughs> you only have the one shot. So right. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really come in handy. No, but I, I, I was trying to say I did kind of... Maybe I subconsciously was worried about that or not positively engaging the hammer all the way because I did ride the hammer all the way down and made sure when I was lifting my thumb back off of it that it was staying in place. Yeah, and you know, we might be making too much of it, but if you think about it, if you're carrying this decocked because that trigger is very light, mm -hmm. and so somebody comes at you and you have to cock it and then aim and fire, 
if you're in a hurry and you slap off that, you could just pff, discharge. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you're driving onto it really hard because you're trying to make sure you don't have that problem. Right. But you don't feel, a, there's no way under pressure you're going to feel that click. Mm-mm. Or hear it. Right. Well, you can't feel it already, so you'd have to hear it. Right. Nope. That's a little scary, isn't it? Yeah, I don't yeah. like that. So anyway, I'm sorry, I overrode you on the trigger. No, you're fine. Uh, the trigger itself, it didn't really feel that heavy. Like you said, it actually was a pretty light trigger, so that was kind of nice. Yeah. Um, there really wasn't any travel to it. It was just releasing the hammer striker, I guess you would technically call it. What you looking for? I'm right looking there? for that snap cap we had. I was going to let you try the trigger again while we were here because I didn't want you to have to fear. Oh, tear okay, it sure. Yeah. So this is a dummy rubber tipped or rubby, rubber primer snap cap. Thank you. Yep, and then just cock it and give that pull. Just double check that trigger. I, I don't know why I wanted to ride the hammer. No, yeah, there's like nothing to that. Yeah. Single it stage. Is, yeah, single stage, no travel, very light. Um, Honestly, it feels as if there's no way I would ever consider carrying this with a hammer pre-cocked because there would be a definite concern of even just bumping it on the side would even potentially cause that trigger to pull. Now, the first way we shot this was birdshot. Right. How did you feel about it just as a birdshot gun? I mean, that was pretty fine. I was able to nail some clays with it, mm -hmm. um, so that felt pretty good. Right. Um, we were using extra light loads. Yeah. And basically target loads. Yeah. And there wasn't much, too much recoil with the birdshot, because I mean, it's birdshot. I mean, there's not going to be a lot of recoil with that in general. <laughs> right. I mean... You, Compared you can, to buck. You could... I mean, yeah, but you can run it up if you need to run the pressure. But we were running low pressure stuff. Mm -hmm. We were trying not to peed up the gun. Right. Um, it, recoil anything noticeable? Nothing that remarkable. I mean... Because that's a fairly light gun compared to... Think about, like, the, the guns we usually see, even the single-shot military rifles, are, like, what, like, nine pounds? Yeah. And this is somewhere around the order of six? I don't know why. It just didn't feel that heavy today. Maybe it's because it's been a while since I've been shooting shotguns. It just didn't feel that like it was that much to me. I don't know. This thing is really to light up. compared to a military rifle. I mean, it is. I'm sure there was substantial recoil. My brain is just not recalling it as well. But I swear I didn't have that too bad of a recoil. No, no, no. The well, they were very light. Well, the bird shot was very light. Yeah, because we're still talking about bird, bird to my knowledge. Yeah. Okay. So then you fire it. <laughs> and then I fire you it. You broke some clays. Yep. Did break some clays. And then extraction. Um... I honestly legitimately forgot for the very first time I went to extract that there is no actual extractor to ejector. it. Ejector, I guess. Yeah. yeah, it had an extractor, but didn't have an ejector. So effectively, it just pooped it out slightly, like little <laughs> tiny goldfish poop that just kind of hung there. <laughs> okay, I got to pull that out now. <laughs> yeah, like when your dog eats the window blinds and you just got to... That happened to my dad once. Really? Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Okay, because I think I know what dog it was, and that should not have been. No, no, no. This is that. before any. Of oh, us were okay. Thank God, because I was about to say I don't know how it managed that. No, That'd be an impressive. Old story. Yeah, this is an old story. Okay. Anyway, there were also probably old blinds that weren't like you know the metal. Yeah, it's been, also what I was thinking. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> that's a different story. Let's stay on the gun. I'm sorry, I did not mean to open up that world for you. We'll put that back in the box. <laughs> Let's keep That's going. for later when I have that socket so, that I've yeah. been saving. So, so you open her up. Yeah. You've got a sample right here. I, I, I do, okay. Oh, it ejected just fine, May. You liar. <laughs> what I've got tilted up. <laughs> to be fair, you can just sort of clack it open and That's do that. That's true. You could just do that. But me on range totally forgot for a moment. So I opened it up and I was like, what? So then I opened it up again and I went, oh, <laughs> yeah, we yeah, that's right. you double opening it trying <laughs> to get like, an ejection. That's right. Yeah, it does eject. Again, okay. you were spoiled by that ELOFs. I I was actually, yeah, it's pretty positive. Um, which is actually a point in the favor of the Stevens. So, you know, I believe the Stevens 94 came out the year after this. I think that's why it's called a 94. I have not done any research on Stevens 94s. Mm -hmm. But that was an auto ejector that was cheaper than this gun. Yeah. So that would have been a, you know, it wasn't self cocking, but it was more of a traditional hammer and it had uh, the ability to do auto eject. Are you okay over there? No, no, no. I'm good. I was just doing that thing where I was double checking to see if there's any way I could accidentally overlip the extractor and oh, accidentally break get it. it i was trying to see for a second because it's always a curious feature to see if they really tried to prevent the dumb right. from happening and they did this actually is not lippable you cannot get over that because of this rim on the actual uh cartridge right here so that's fantastic okay cool nice feature All thank right. you um i'm very disappointed in you by the way We've been going through this whole ergonomic section. Okay. You've made zero mention of the... Uh, Semi-pistol grip. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about it. I've yeah. been thinking about this whole time. Did that help? It was actually very comfortable. Um, this one in particular has a nice rake to it. It's very smooth. Um, I personally thought it was fantastically placed. It was great for my hand size. What about you, though? Is this... Uh, let's see. 
I, when I when I actually do the the holding it up, that one actually I'm, feels like it's a perfect because, length too of the of be, the actual butt stock. Because of all the rifle stuff, I'm so used to being out here. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's very awkward to be this far back on a gun sometimes, but it's good for my pivot. I've I've been able to hold a sweep with it pretty fine. I actually shot some clays with it. I I did great with it. Yeah, we took our buddy uh, out to the range with us, Jim, and he was nailing some clays with this. Oh thing. yeah, Jim was with us with this. Yeah. Well, to be fair, Jim was smart. He knew we were working with essentially uh, low. Talk, low we need to film him instead of me. We were working with low and slow loads, so you have to take a stronger lead. Mm -hmm. So at first it was. Where am I? Because I'm shooting them like they're modern smokeless loads that mm -hmm. are that are regular power. And I'm going, wait a second, these are moving real slow. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to really swing over and lead and poof. But it was working fine for Bird. Let's, however, talk about Buck. Because that's really what was going on in the Philippines. Yeah. Realistically, there's not really much difference. Um, you're loading it the same. You're cocking the gun the same. And then you're extracting it the same. The real only difference is going to be uh, just you're not you're not shooting into the air at the clay. You're going to be shooting at something coming at you on the ground yeah. or something that's just level with you. I should have thrown rabbits. Dang, you should have thrown rabbits. <laughs> that would have been so hard with buckshot, though. Um, it really would have been. Yeah, I love it. So we shot buckshot at, I believe, 50 yards. Yes. Uh, the gun printed just a little bit, I think, to the left overall. Mm -hmm. At least that's where I think our missing shots went were to the left. Yep, I think so, too. And... We, I want to say, pumped three rounds yes, into the target? Yes, we did three rounds. What we had some extra spares that we tested out later on, but there, there was definitely three rounds for the shoot. All right, we had some solid hits. Yep. How was the recoil? Substantial. Um, certainly more than birdshot. Uh, it, it definitely, uh, because I was holding it more level, just felt like more of a linear recoil, though. So it kind of just felt right. like something just sharply shoving on my shoulder, which was... Not too terrible, but there was a fair amount of force behind that. And they wanted it to be black powder, mm -hmm. full brass, which mm -hmm. is what we uh, recreated. Thank you, Suze, Smoke. by the way, for slapping us together. Oh, yeah, Suze did an awesome job. All yeah. of them ran, so that was that was great. Right, so you you pull the trigger yeah. and... A loud sound, fantastic sound, very throaty. The black God, powder like throw on that. like a smooth bore muzzle loader. We, we actually thought we could do a second shooting segment. So the, we had the first segment all filmed and done. And we were like, oh, we've got these extra loads. Why don't we do a second shoot segment? Okay, cool. No, it's totally not usable in that it, I just get lost in a sea of cloud <laughs> because it didn't move anywhere. It just stayed with me. Yeah, the second and then time afterwards, I, for 10 minutes... The the smoke was just dancing on the grass leaves. It was amazing. Yeah, you were like a ninja. It was just poof, and then you were gone to yeah. the cameras and I everybody just, else. Apparently, that's what the ninja should have done instead of whatever Which, else way, they were doing. Boy, did we get lucky on the wind on the first takes. Because oh, we yeah. only had so many rounds with us. And I didn't then if think it, it was going to be that bad. And then, oh, goodness, no. Well, infamously, this happened to us with the Swiss 78, <clears throat> which is a beautiful revolver that you can barely that see in the footage. got lost. Because for whatever reason, the wind just dumped right on it top of us. It spiraled. I mean, it's, it's crazy when that happens and kind of cool, but terrible for showing you guys. You know, it happens more often than that because in the show, we try to film in the shade. Which is yes. usually a little cove. So a lot of these repercussion guns have been kind of difficult for that because if the if the plume starts to make the gun disappear, we're kind of like, eh, maybe we should try to refilm that. And then the caps get pissy. You just called this a repercussion gun. I, I said for the repercussion series. Oh, okay. Yeah. You said these repercussion guns. So, it's so like, We just filmed repercussion <laughs> stuff. Oh what? my God. No, that was a totally separate episode. We haven't just been in the same room for an hour. Yeah. I, and we kept the same clothing on for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, how that I always sense. live. Yeah, this is what I live in This now. is my two week outfit. I mean, this is what I shoot in mostly now. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, BS aside. Yeah. Recoil was stout. Recoil was stout. Uh, yeah. With the, black, with the buckshot. How was the sound? Amazing. I love that throaty sound that came from it. It much, sounded so forceful. How much faith did you have that you weren't about to blow up? Um, It was about 50-50, if I had to be honest on that, because... The, these this was our first time testing them out too, so I didn't really know what was going to happen. We should have filmed it. We fil we will test fire guns with a lead sled. Yep. And string fire. Mm -hmm. And we did with the birdshot and had no problems. <laughs> and it, it did a little tiny little little baby hip. Yeah. Hop. Well, <laughs> pro tip, pro tip, take a fresh fresh patch uh -huh. of some sort, like yeah. what fresh cloth. Mm -hmm. Throw it over the breech. Mm -hmm. Then throw a blanket over that on mm -hmm. the lead sled. Pull the trigger. Right. Right. That way the blanket the holds the, the piece of thing. In mm -hmm. it, yeah. 
And when we did that with our little patch, we actually ended up with this powder burn. That was like right along a the perfect breach. line. Just it's perfect. A, I showed to me, I was like, this thing's not uh, gas sealed at the moment. <laughs> well, you could see it on the footage, by the mm -hmm. way. I, yeah. I went back mm -hmm. and I viewed it and I see little piffs of yep. stuff going up. Uh, and I'm and like, mm -hmm. To oh, give yeah. May credit, May goes, well... No, that's probably all right. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I can't see it going back and over. That it, And it wasn't. It literally was just going straight up. So yeah. that, that's fine. Yeah, nothing shook loose. No. So. That's fine. If the sled could handle it, so could I. Okay, that's fine. That was my reasoning. That's not how it works, but sure. <laughs> yeah. So not a lot of confidence. <laughs> However, hits on target? Hits on target. I can't argue with that. How are those slightly to the left? That was interesting. I did aim a little further right um, for my After last that, shot, yeah. and I still somehow saw that a few of them went left. Well, don't forget, too, this is an old 32-inch barrel. The What the Philippine Constabulary had were probably 28 inches. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know what, honestly, this is so easy to take apart. I love out. how easy that takedown is, too. Do you actually really like the takedown? Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, for being able to throw it in for a bag, purposes, it's fantastic. Cause you perfect. Just, you do all that, and then you take this and just reattach it. And right, I go. thought about that. Yeah, you can just pop yeah. that on. Done, and you've only got two pieces. It doesn't, Perfect. to the naked eye, it seems fine. Although, ooh, there is a little bit of a ring in there, actually. Um, a lot of times when you get these older shotguns, people don't know that the gun itself is, ooh, yeah, okay. The, people don't know that the gun itself is choked from the factory, mm -hmm. usually. And so they'll start running uh, buckshot, or not buckshot, they'll run slugs in it mm -hmm. and tear the choke up a fair bit. But another big thing is a lot of the really old stuff was made before all these shot cups and things. Right. And so they're actually tighter choked than you realize. Like the old full choke was tighter. And so you start running modern ammo in it, and it really starts to do some damage to that choke, and you get unusual patterning after that. Mm -hmm. um, there are guys that really like to shoot these vintage shotguns that will obsessively check to see that it hasn't been shot with modern ammunition because it will ruin that choke. Um, and on that topic, when we recreated the ammo, we did not use a modern shot cup. So, uh, I think we have to weigh in on a very old video game debate, which is that a lot of people like to go out with modern shotguns in riot configuration and okay. shoot them at targets 50 yards away, 100 yards away, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. and measure how much they open up. And then they look at something that's set in World War One and World War II, and they say, oh, this is BS. Why, why is the shotgun spread like this in this World War One video game? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, they didn't have shot cups. No. So, at 50 yards... You guys look at the spread on that target. Right. It opens up. And yeah. that's a 32 inch barrel yeah. on this gun. And it is still opening up that much at 50 yards. Impressive. So, <laughs> <laughs> shot cups are very interesting pieces of technology. Yeah. Um, also, the change in choking thing are very interesting. But mm -hmm. a lot of the older guns actually open up more than you think. That is still surprising. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, it, how wide it, it Yeah, it just, you don't expect it to do that, but then sure enough, that spread is there. Yeah. Anyone next to that guy is definitely getting some extra. Yeah, it's not a precision instrument. No. So, uh, if you had that, mm -hmm. four inches shorter, mind you, and okay. you were on patrol mm -hmm. with one in the chamber, hammer uncocked, mm -hmm. how confident are you that, hey, let's say there's two of you. There's, you know, you got a oh, buddy. Oh, two of me. Well, you're not the only, you know, because this isn't necessarily a solitary thing, right? You, there'd be a couple guys marching together. Sure. So it's the two of us. We both have one. Okay, cool. And someone comes out of the brush and starts slashing. Mm hmm What do you think our chances are of landing a hit between our two shots? Well, I'm assuming we're shooting buck, too, right? right. Oh, yeah, definitely buck. Definitely buck. Okay. Between our two shots, yeah, we've got a decent enough spread that if it's just a single dude coming at us between the two of us, I can't see one of us not catching him some. Right. And one so. of the advantages of the long barrel is that you know where you're pointing. The, right. The, there's just a natural tendency to be more accurate with a longer barrel at sh those short ranges. Yes. So I'm actually feeling pretty strongly that I can knock a dude down with this gun, even yeah, with the one yeah, shot. Yeah, I agree. It I felt can't see it being... very authoritative. Now, I mean, I don't know if something like um, maybe one of the Moro might be a little more difficult because they do that binding and stuff that kind of makes them... Yeah, but if you hit them in the chest... If you hit torso with yeah, that thing, yeah. If you hit torso with it, it was still like there were still several number of shots like right there in a in a close region. So if you were to put it directly on the chest, yeah, I guess I could see it being. You know, I wonder how many of these were lost in combat simply because once you get the first round off, this is what's in your hand, and you just start beating them with it. I mean, if if you're I ain't short worried on about time, it, I'm going to break the gun. I don't care. I'm just going to be swinging it. Right. No. If you if you if they're right on top of you. 
Are you going to take the time to try to unload and reload and cock and then go? Oh, yeah. No, probably not. <laughs> Unless you just go in a circle, like right. running around each other. You shoot. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a firing line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, it's but like, like a two man firing line. It's like, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> but there are actually, I didn't go into too much detail on this because we did mention it somewhat in uh, other episodes. Mm -hmm. If you do some digging on numerous reports in the Philippines, on especially the Judimentado or the Moro in general, they'll talk about these determined attackers coming in. And I have repeatedly found accounts where the guy will get in there and manage to slice up or kill like one or two U.S. soldiers or officers. And then uh, there are multiple stories that end with, and then dude number three dropped him with a shotgun blast. Right. They don't never say what shotgun. And people usually assume it's a Winchester, but chances are statistically those stories are this gun, mm -hmm. which is that oh, ah, all you know, by the way, you're not prepared. You're just no. you're you're hanging out. It's Tuesday. All of a sudden all hell breaks loose. Homie's already dead before you know what's going on. Right. And then next thing you know, this thing like you saw May with that just that boom and smoke and whatever it is just falls over dead and you're going and it's over. It's over as fast it's an as that. Happens. Yeah. Kind of situation. That is wild. Mm -hmm. Now, it's time for the curveball. Okay. Are you ready for the curveball? Maybe. This with the buckshot or mm -hmm. a Peabody rifle. Peabody rifle also has a manually cocked hammer, single shot with a quick action to open and get in and out of there. Yep. So realistically, it's going to depend on the scenario is the problem, because yeah. if you're thinking about the Peabody, you know, it's going to be 43 Spanish. Is it not that'll be, that'll be better for longer ranges, that kind of thing. Um, however, if it's like against someone like the German Tato, I'm going to want something like the shotgun because it's going to have the actual spread for, for capturing someone that's right up on me. I mean, a single shot miss with that in that kind of a scenario would be would go poorly, but if I don't hit directly on target with this guy, it's still possible it'll it'll still peg him because yeah, you of the got a spread. bigger spread at fifty right. yards than I do. So long ranges, sure, yeah, I'll take the Peabody, but shorter ranges, I'm gonna go with this guy. Now, I guess it just depends on what I'm what my role is essentially. I've in, I've actually issued you an interesting conundrum too, okay. because this is not an unusual uh, thought for them at the time. Right. I did the Peabody because it's so similar in the sense that it has the offside hammer, mm -hmm. although you're just like the tumbler over there. And then I've got this lever down here, but you've got that lever up there. Right. So very comparable. But the cartridge, it's 43 Spanish, yep. the way this one's put together. Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually what they were up against a lot of the time. And it's also what they had an option to use a lot of time because those guys were working with. Now, this is an Argentine <coughs> variety, not a Spanish variety, but it's going to be it. similar enough if I can. Ooh, 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 bonk. They're working with Wall these. Wall is real. Yeah. <laughs> So this is this is an Argentine rolling block, but similar, almost identical construction, except for it probably would have had a firing pin safety and it would have had a different Knox form. You get the idea. Sure. So your enemy has maybe these. Mm -hmm. Do you want that? Uh, not up against that. No, I'm probably going to want to go with the Peabody option. Yeah, you've got multiple hundreds of yards of accuracy with this. Right. Exactly. Completely ineffective. Or with a rolling block option. Yeah. But. You have the choice to be issued this, mm -hmm. and you're walking down the you know jungle path. Mm -hmm. mm, jungle path, right? Uh, that's the game, and feel the weight difference too. Try swinging that barrel around by comparison. Oh yeah, no, that's and, a lot of weight difference. And this would have been shorter at the time than it is now, right? So these things are light. They're balanced to the rear. They're designed for swing. Mm -hmm. This here, let me take this guy. Like this is that's more designed for I mean, rapid acquisition. Don't knock anything over, but just give that a swing for a second. Try to swing on a moving target coming at you, right? No, nah, it's still definitely a lot more difficult. I mean, try that one. This one's just better for pivoting with. Yeah, that's way better. Isn't that wild? Uh, it's just a difference of what I'm going to be doing, I guess. If I if I'm on maybe a tall wall guard duty, I'm going to want something like the rolling. Oh block. yeah, definitely. Versus if I'm traveling around. I'm probably going to want something that's, you know, going to have that spread, going to have that lightness to it. I'm going to be honest with you. If I feel like my threat is under 50 yards. There, this guy. 100%. Somewhere around 75 yards, it gets a little bit iffy. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I would agree. But by the time you're out to 100? No question. Yeah. yeah. But you can't carry both. No. 
which tells you some of what they were up against in terms of how they had to think about this even when they want to transition away from that. True. So... That's unfortunate. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Good I'll let you guys card. debate like uh, which you would prove... Pr- you guys give me your picks at over 100 and under 50, mm-hmm. and I guess somewhere in the 75 range. I have nowhere to put this down because there's stuff all over the floor from the previous filming episode. There Good job. Is. You stay. Uh, yeah, leave it all in the comments. But you and I, I think we're, we're done, I think right? we're square. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Happiness. Well, um, outside of the Philippine stuff, do you, what, what's your personal, just emotional feeling towards that shotgun? Honestly, um, I liked it and enjoyed it far more than I thought it would simply because of being able to shoot those brass um, buck shells. That was yeah, just a black powder That truck. was really cool. Like that was awesome. And they and they functioned so well. So Seuss did an awesome job on those. That was that was great to be able to test those out. I think that made me appreciate enjoying this gun far more than I originally would have. If it had just been if I'd been just shooting bird out of it, if I'd been just shooting standard whatever buck rounds we had laying around out of it. I don't think it would have made a difference, but I think the aesthetic look of it all with the brass shells really pulled it together for me. I frankly like this gun. Um, I wish it was in a little more steady condition because I don't think it can handle like 100 shots at a uh, sporting play range. Mm -hmm. I think it would kind of fall apart after 50. Yeah. Uh, Although I could use the light loads, I guess, but boy, some of those faster birds would be hard to hit. I'd be curious to try a spread comparison between that and the 28 to see. You know... If anybody has a ruined one and just has the spare barrel, I'm willing to make a little bit of work out of that. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of these that are not in running condition and irrevocably so. Right. So if there's one that turns up inexpensively somewhere where the barrel can be salvaged and turned down to 28, I'd actually be really curious to yeah. make a proper reproduction of what they would have had. That would have been neat. And just see if it opens up anymore. Mm-hmm. That'd be kind of a fun project to do on the side channel. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing that stands out to me the most... Mm-hmm is how this is only maybe a year or so apart from the Stevens 94. Oh, yeah. And feels a decade older. Oh, yeah. Uh, Remington really feels like they were behind the gun on this. This feels so out of date. Mm -hmm. And the improvements that they were made took until like 1903 to execute. And by then, the market was well ahead of them. Different, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know why, but this, as much as it's nice to learn the history, I think technologically, this was a missed step on Remington's part. Which is probably why they're really not that well remembered. There's very little written about these. Very few people even know they exist. And yet, a key well, part of the, the guys Philippine who are watching military this now know they yeah. exist. And the few women, which is apparently a certain percentage of the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> like yeah, we have a very small percentage of women. Well, watching. someone get dragged along by the husband. Oh, uh, that's true. Yeah. But anyway, Those lucky gals. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for watching. And yep. uh, have a good one. Yeah. Have a good night. I, the only thing I really put up on Patreon was a link to the Sasquatch video. Otherwise, I haven't really shared a bunch of it. I think I shared the BSA one, the keep, Raylock. Keep an eye on that. I'm going to try to put things in there uh, because I don't have to worry about that channel being wiped out right now. Yeah, it's true. So anything show... that's off the cuff that uh, we're already recording either for animation purposes or something that we were we we've constantly in the background, by the way, been recording extra little bits with our phones and stuff because we just found it entertaining ourselves or we used it for reference material later right but adding just a little bit of structure to it can go a long way right i learned it's not too difficult to nail to headshot pilots in bombers and whatever the other big plane is i forget what that one's called However, I got two in one map this morning, and I got accused of being a hacker, and it's not <laughs> true. Because you just kept shooting them out of their place. The bomber kept flying really low. It was on that Monte Grappa's map. And you know the one I'm talking yeah, about yeah, with, yeah. The, with the hills? Like, and he just flew over twice really low, and both times, ping, ping. And when the plane went down <laughs> the like, second like, time, he started screaming line, hacker. And I've got a Martini in her. I'm just going to put a 450 through. My favorite was someone else commented. They were like, she can't be hacking because her score is shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little proud of myself because I was reading through the material and it turns out that that's the second pattern of seer rest or the of tumbler rest. Uh-huh. The uh, the first pattern 
which actually got into the guns and had to be yanked back out after uh, uh, however many were made. Yeah, you were telling me about this. Yeah, they were nursing. So they would they, they had a chance of smacking the butt hard enough to discharge the firearm. And I went, well, I guess that's why that cut was there. Uh-huh. And I was like, I'm a little proud of myself for figuring that one out before it even got, you know, and I, I didn't know, but I was like, God, it's almost like that's what it's for. Yep, that's what it was for. Okay. Double lot nine pellet buckshot. These were initially plain paper cased cartridges, but they did not weather well in the field. Moisture caused them to swell, and repeated loading and unloading wore them down much faster than brass ammo. So the army would order that, which was more expensive. However, few would arrive on the front lines before.